there is one rule which is a constant throughout all time, it is that conscious beings want to get high. Life itself may be a complex endeavor, but at the end of the day, what we humans want is usually simple. Pizza and Netflix and three bedrooms in a good neighborhood. But stepping beyond the boundaries of what is sensible, we also want to feel pleasure. I mean, life is a little bit strange. We're afraid to talk about sex and drugs. I think everyone probably knows that these two things, with the exception of love, can generate the most desirable experiences we are capable of having here on Earth. So why are we afraid of mindless self-indulgence? Well, there's layers of complexity around this, which are actually galvanizing forces for the very soul of culture. We want to see celebrities in their swimsuits, but we don't want to objectify them. Seeing violence on a film is fun, but seeing violence in real life is traumatic. We want to get drunk on a Saturday night, but we are afraid of legalizing marijuana. I mean, really, there's so much to unpack here, but I'm going to make a case that there is actually no reason to be afraid of pleasure. Let's start with something that no one can argue with. Math. Let's say that there is a certain period of time which you will theoretically exist in. You are allowed a certain amount of happiness within this period, but it is finite. There is nothing you can do to change it. You can, if you want, allocate all the happiness into a single epic moment, and then feel nothing for all the other moments. You can also allocate it equally across all time, or space it out like a waveform, whatever you want. The purpose of this thought experiment does not care about the actual amount of time or happiness occurring, but in how you allocate it. Maybe you would just want it to be random. There are basically three options. I already told you one of them, really. One is the randomly dispersed option. The second is a more patterned option, like a series of peaks and valleys, which you may calculate in regards to what you think would help you cope most effectively. Though cope is a faulty word, really, because I haven't defined how much total happiness there is in this case study. The third is tied to either infinity or zero. They are actually, in this case, the same option, which is the choice to either put your happiness in one moment or divide it equally between on all moments. They are th actually the same because what is being measured here is intensity of experience, and at a level of zero intensity, there is, in fact, no experience. Time itself ceases, because in this example, time is actually more intimately linked to how much you want to parse out the happiness than how you might typically think of the concept of time. I like to think of it like a roller coaster. You can either have one which constantly surprises you, uh, one with the most total drops throughout, or one with a single huge drop. Those are the basic options. Now, you probably have all kinds of feelings about which one you would choose. Maybe you would even hybridize them somehow. Every single feeling you have about what you'd do in this situation is, in the most fundamental sense of the word, subjective. That is the primary thing to observe in this thought experiment. There is no objective benefit in choosing any of them, even though in some ways people would say, that the more moderate approach is somehow better than, say, the single drop approach. They, society, want to say that at some, that some sense of moderation is objectively better, touting this subjective perspective as something that is objectively true. But the only things that are objective here are the parameters, that is, how much time, how much happiness. If you were truly a rational being without any bias, you would not care in any way how the happiness is arranged. But this is often not the case for most people, and so if you can understand in yourself why you might feel one option to be superior to another option, you can understand your own inner biases. A big part of this is because of how we relate to our past, or in general, fears we might have about how we feel reality should be like. People who are risk-takers risk might be more inclined to seek the big highs, 
And there's really nothing objectively wrong with risk-taking as long as you know the odds and they're at least equivalent in the risk-reward factor. In the same way, there is nothing objectively wrong with seeking pleasure, at least until you take the real world into account. With that important note, let's talk about drugs. It is a misconception that drugs make you feel good. What they actually do is enable your brain to use more of the resources that are already available in your body within a concentrated amount of time. One interesting example is caffeine. It does not make you feel awake, it actually blocks receptors in your brain that make you feel tired. So then your brain can continue to draw the bodily resources it needs to continue functioning in an awake state longer. We all have a certain amount of chemicals in our brain that keep us feeling okay throughout the day. And when you're talking about happiness, it's not as simple as just dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. It's just as, sim as complex and diverse as the wide array of drugs that exist. Look at this chart for an idea. Link in the description. Uh, even if you're completely sober, it's uh, some kind of a combination of these types of feelings. And that may not initially make sense, but I think if you could take any particular type of feeling, uh, you could find a drug that is associated with it or enhances that particular feeling. And you need all types of feelings. If you just had one happy feeling, then it would start to feel bad slash redundant. And these different feelings we have every day are created by different combination of things like dopamine and serotonin in our heads. But to de-sciencify things a bit, you can basically imagine that every day you wake up sucking a lemon. Like an actual whole lemon. The lemon only has so much juice. You do everything you can to make this lemon last through the whole day. Because that lemon juice is converted in your brain into happiness. When you do a drug, it's like instead of trying to maintain a steady level of happiness, you just take a week's worth of lemons and squeeze them into your brain all at one time. And it feels good in the moment, but then again, you just lost a week's worth of your life's happiness. At least that's how it would work in a perfect world. But that's not quite it. I'm just going to say now that happiness is the opposite of stress, so keep that in mind for later on. Um, in reality, what happens when you take a drug is that you get seven lemons of happiness in that moment, and you lose twice that amount in lemons. Seven lemons for the price of 14. So, drugs are bad. Never do them. End of story, right? Wrong. Oh no, you have no idea how wrong you are. Drugs are everywhere in society, on multiple levels. Sometimes you need drugs to get by in life, like with medic medications. Sometimes you want drugs to facilitate social events to make life's best moments into things really worth living for. Sometimes you need a drug to perform at your highest potential, temporarily. But no matter the case, a drug is a drug, and that means sacrificing a certain amount of lemons. Am I saying all of these things drugs are used for are bad, then? Actually, no. If you're depressed, you might feel so bad that it inhibits your ability to function or even makes you suicidal. In that case, sacrificing a few lemons is wise because you could actually get a lengthy amount of years where you are fully, op fully operational. Uh, sometimes you should drink alcohol at a party because you want to make the most out of that time you spend with the people you like. And I don't think I need to get into all the music that has been made by people high on drugs. Overall, it looks like the contribution of drugs to society is a positive one, doesn't it? Well, sadly, no. There's something I'm not telling you here. Something that changes everything. Lemons are only one piece of the puzzle. If I were to stop the metaphor here, that would be a gross oversimplification. And that is exactly the problem with society's thinking as it stands currently. But there was a reason I took you all through all the thinking we've had so far, and that was to establish, one, that there is no mathematical reason you would want to avoid drugs if there was an equivalent exchange of lemons, and two, that beyond acquiring temporary happiness, there are 
demonstrable reasons for drugs to exist. So here's where things get complicated. We need to stop thinking about lo uh, lemons and think about calories instead. Without calories, you can't do anything, including being happy. Obviously, you would feel like crap if you didn't eat anything. But to go beyond that, your body actually has to allocate a certain number of calories, or I'll just start saying energy instead of calories now, in order to be happy. But if it were as simple as that, why aren't we all happy? Well, the body is complicated, and the brain is even more complicated. You don't often think of the brain as something that burns calories, but that is a misconception. A study was done on chess players, and it actually found that when playing a tournament, they can burn around 6,000 calories in one day. That's because their brains are literally turned to maximum overdrive and are trying to optimize energy to be used as fast as possible to process what they are doing to their highest potential. Basically, when the pressure's on, energy gets burned. I've actually observed this in myself. I eat a lot and I play high intensity video games. And one time I went about a month without video games and I lost 20 pounds because I was eat eating so much less. Sure enough, I started playing again, I ate more, and regained the weight. So calories are required to do everything from thinking to moving to processing stimuli, and even for subconscious processes. Even your immune system needs to burn calories. And you can't use calories unless they've been fully digested, and that, guess what, also requires calories. It's all energy. I mean, just think about the concept of energy for a second. Nothing in the universe exists without it. And the crazy thing is that scientists can't even agree on or determine exactly what it is. So let's go back to lemons. You need happiness to function, but now you need to prioritize. Do you want to be happy or smart? Do you want to have a strong immune system or have better focus? Maybe you have noticed that there's a pretty common trope of people who are geniuses, uh, but they are a little bit crazy. Uh, well, this won't be true for all geniuses, but I think a lot of them are just putting so much energy into their thought processes that they just don't have the time or energy to actually act normal or care about the things which they deem less important. Obviously, you can't make a lot of the decisions of how calories get allocated uh, for your own self. A lot of it is genetics and your unconscious working for you. Your unconscious formed a lot of these things based on your early development as well. Like, people who are raised in an environment where they don't get enough nutrition, uh, their immune systems prepare them for a life where food is more scarce. That can change over time, though, because the unconscious is not completely static. The rest just organizes around what kind of person you are and what kind of lifestyle you are anticipating for yourself. And this is, by the way, uh, an underappreciated aspect of the immune system. I don't know if there's an exact term for it in science, but I know this is a real thing, and the term I'll invent for it is anticipatory antibodies. There are some parallels to, like, the placebo effect here, but I'm applying it in a more broad way. Like, for example, if you lived in ancient times of being a hunter-gatherer, your body would build up energy to survive the winter long before winter actually sets in. Your body will even create anticipatory antibodies for things you expect, whether or not they are likely to or actually do happen. So before you can be happy, your body has to run through a checklist and say all these factors have been accounted for, then they ensure, ensure your survival. Uh, but then things get murky when you go from the realm of surviving into the realm of actually thriving. And there's room for things like self-sabotage, when you say don't do something that would actually be good for your long-term well-being, but, you know, you mentally justify it for the immediate gratification of procrastinating. I mean, just think about this. How many people do you know that are pretty smart, but are also depressed? The body can't always do everything you want, be happy, and still be smart at the same time. Or, here's an example anyone can relate to. You ever had an orgasm and then immediately feel tired? I feel like 
this aspect of sex is very underrepresented in mainstream culture. You probably even feel tired for the rest of the entire day. And there's a reason things like uh, No Nut November and religious abstinence exist, because when you abstain from sex, your body has a lot more energy. Like, I remember as a younger teen, I read on this anti-masturbation website that every orgasm uses the same amount of energy as a portion of steak the same size of a deck of playing cards. And your body can only process so much food into energy in one day, so it's not like you can just eat more. It was good motivation for me to quit the habit. Anyway, remember when I said that stress is the opposite of happiness? Uh, let's dig into that. I was going to say next that with eustress, a word combining the words stress and euphoria, this is not always the case, but now I disagree with myself. If you are playing, let's say, laser tag, there is a stress involved in trying to succeed and the stress you feel when you get shot by another player. But this stress, the negative stress, uh, hopefully is overshadowed by the good feelings of having made a successful shot perhaps in the future. It's not that you enjoy the stress that happens when you're shot, it's just that the stress is a precursor to feelings of success and you denotate that as being worth it. So yeah, normal stress is really no different from what people call eustress. A bit off topic, but yeah. Eustress doesn't exist, so GTFO Tim Ferriss. But wait just a darn minute, let me go back on my idea again. Okay, eustress is a thing, but it's not something that just happens by itself, as is implied often. It is something you have to decide upon. And when you are experiencing stress, you are saying to yourself in some way, I accept this stress, and I'm not going to dwell on it, or let myself get angry about any past failures. I'm doing what must or should be done in tune with my own body and mind. And that, when you do that, the stress can actually convert itself into positive feelings, because you have learned the correct sense of priorities you should have. Anyway, I'm getting off topic with that. <clears throat> When you feel stress, it's usually an indicator that you need to do something like hunger or boredom are telling you to eat or entertain yourself. Stress is a motivator. So it happens when you want slash need something but can't immediately get it. Hunger is stress, boredom is stress. But one is a need and one is a want. So what's the difference? It's not as clear as you might think. One is the notification your body gives you. When you're thirsty, you don't consciously desire your body to be lubricated and all the various things that you need water for. You just desire the feeling of water hitting your mouth. Needs tend to be driven by the unconscious, the body. A want is something that generally makes more immediate sense to your ego or sense of self. But it's a little more complicated than that because in reality, you don't need as much food or water to survive as you actually are wanting to eat. Like, imagine being hooked up to this machine, and it just barely keeps you alive, giving you the absolute minimum. Uh, that would be probably the worst, worst possible experience you could imagine. But there's a little bit of a paradox here. If you give someone the bare minimum to stay alive, their long-term lifespan will go down. Obviously, you say. But what's not so obvious is that by concluding that, you actually admit that there is no such thing as a need compared to a want. I want you to think about when you're bored, like really, really bored. It can actually become painful, worse than physical pain even. Well, you know that your body produces pain is pain. If you're suffering mentally, your body has to do what it can to acclimate to that as well. Both physical and mental stress require your brain to do what it can to minimize the pain. This raises some interesting questions. Does that mean that boredom is actually bad for you? Crazy as it may sound, this is exactly my hypothesis. Boredom gets a bad rap. I can understand that there are rational reasons for this, but it's not exactly justified. Like, obviously we need a tolerance for boredom in order to have a strong work ethic. I understand this idea but I don't sympathize with it perhaps as much as most people would. Uh, there are a few reasons for this. 
First off, people have an inflated sense of pride in the fact that they work long jobs. The sense of pride makes it hard for them to actually appreciate that there are systemic alternatives to having to work a hard job because in their mind they're saying, I'm important, the system works, so it shouldn't change. This job grants me the respect I deserve from my colleagues and allows me to support my family. And that's all fine and well until you become dogmatic about it, which sadly most people are. In this video, I talked about how exercise is bad for you. But you know what's even worse? Working a boring job 40 hours a week, doing repetitive tasks that drain you of your energy. If people didn't have to do this, not only would they be happier, but they'd live longer, too. I've heard the trope repeated a few times that wealthy people don't develop lines on their faces signaling age as soon as poorer people who may have to work hard jobs do. Well, go figure. If you've been following along so far, then you would understand that expending more energy means less energy in your body for other things such as happiness. That stress is a signal from your body that it needs something, and the more stress builds up over time and the more energy gets used, the more your lifespan depletes. This is because, going back to the lemons, you only get one lemon for every day of your life you live. Your body is only going to get so much energy before it starts to wear out over time. But what if we were to think more conservatively? What if we use less energy than we are given every day? Well, that's exactly what I wanted to get into. Using a combination of everything I've talked about, conserving physical and mental energy, eating food that has been conserved properly, like I talked about in this video, avoiding boredom when you can, and following an assortment of rules for health, which I have come up with, I think we could increase the human lifespan dramatically. This is not a crazy idea. We already know from the past that following good health practices can increase the lifespan of the entire human species. But if this, what if this could be the next step? Could we live? <laughs> Our science has brought us far, but there are still many things that are left to speculation. People are fighting all the time over which diet plan is the best, whether meat is healthy, whether medications are healthy. But the simple truth is that nothing is unhealthy. As I spoke about again in my unhealthy food video, whether or not a food is healthy depends not on what it is, but the conservation of it. I will tell you straight up, no jumper cables, to go and buy a tube of toothpaste that comes with a removable airtight seal, like the, the little silver ones you seal off, you peel off before you uh, start using them. Rip the seal off and take a significant swig immediately after you do. That's right, do try this at home. I promise you, you will be fine. This is the best proof I can offer that the only reason we think certain foods are healthy is because they don't decay as quickly. Toothpaste is perfectly okay to eat, but decays quickly, which makes it poison. If correct conservation principles are used, any food can be made healthy to eat. The same is true of medications, and yes, even drugs. Even meat, which I don't eat for reasons of morality, is healthy as long as it is either frozen or kept in a vacuum-sealed container before eating. So let's go back to lemons again. Remember how I said that when you do drugs, you sacrifice 14 lemons for 7 lemons worth of immediate pleasure? That's not because of the essential nature of the drug. If you were to actually follow proper procedures for conservation of the drug, it would be a simple 7 for 7 lemons. The 14 number comes from the fact that your immune system has to spend another 7 lemons on protecting itself from the bacteria that has been making their way into the drug from putrefaction. And the more unnatural the drug, as I said in my video with the opium versus heroin example, with opium being more natural than heroin, which is synthetically derived, the more lemons you'll have to sacrifice to keep your immune system in order. It's like the difference between eating sugar cane and eating sugar crystals that have been separated from the cane for a while without proper conservation techniques. The same principle applies not just to drugs, but to food as well, and is basically why most unhealthy foods are labeled as such by society. The more unhealthy the food is known as being, the worse the lemon ratio is. This is usually because the more a food tastes good, the more it attracts bacteria. And people who are obese are unhealthy not because being fat is actually bad for you, 
because they have consumed more calories, and every calorie that isn't preserved within 100% correct principles will carry detriments. And as things currently stand, that is the case with most things we eat. But we can change that. So while I'm not advocating drug use, at the same time, I think fearing it to the extent we do is irrational. As I spoke about before with the happiness model, there's really no correct way to choose to experience things. Every high has its low, whether it's artificially induced or occurs on its own. And oddly enough, part of the reason people are afraid of drugs is because they know full well that they will enjoy them. Obviously, drugs are still dangerous. There is always the risk of addiction and overdose, and for that reason, I still don't advocate doing drugs. Also, certain medications that prevent you from experiencing symptoms of being sick are bad for you, because things like a runny nose are actually functions of your immune system for ridding the infection in your body. So when you cease this uh, symptom from occurring, you're actually hampering your immune system from getting rid of the infection. But even so, being afraid of drugs just makes it harder for us to properly understand the risks involved. I mean, psychedelic drugs are illegal almost entirely based upon the fear surrounding them. You also get a lot of dogma on the other side with people who are obsessed with psychedelic drugs. I know a lot of people think the psychedelic experience is valuable, and even though it's not quite the same toll on your body as an opioid is usually, there is a different type of toll that has to do with your higher processing. You get the temporary high, but in the long term, you don't have as many lemons in that particular faculty just the same, which is a faculty of higher functioning and thinking. So what does this all amount to? Well, it should change your perception on things like Buddhism. Buddhism is a wonderful practice. It's the rational fear of pleasure. And as far as knowledge exists in the world, world today, it's pretty high tier. But again, it stems from a place of not knowing the whole truth. It's a half-truth, like eating vegetables to be healthy. In fact, eating exactly what you feel like and want to eat is the healthiest thing, because the craving for whatever it is you want, be it fried chicken or white wine, the craving is a stressor trying to signal you to eat what your body most needs. You may even find, interestingly enough, if you were to just eat what you like uh, long enough, you might even start craving things like fresh fruit and vegetables, things that are traditionally considered healthy, because your body does in fact want a wide variety of nutrition sources. But in Buddhism, what they've done is take everything they could be doing with the knowledge that does exist in the world and doing what is best for the most part. They eat very simply and in small portions. They don't indulge in sexuality, and they aim to relax the body instead of straining it. They do meditation, and meditation is uh, very interesting. I used to do it quite often. Um, there are reasons for doing this. Basically, it's the same thing as exercise, but with the mind. The reason I view meditation as higher than exercise is because while exercise of the body is generally done for narcissistic purposes or misguided attempts at bettering health, at least meditation strengthens something which you use every day, which is the mind. You don't really use, you know, a strong bicep every day. Though you may sometimes, of course, if that's, say, your profession. Um, also, there are certain states of mind in which you might find the meditation by itself is actually very enjoyable and calming. Uh, regardless, it is actually still ultimately misguided itself because Buddhists force themselves to do it. This will increase mental fortitude, yes, but at what cost? You have an entire nervous system to consider, and that's what you really are, not just your thoughts which is what meditation generally focuses on. There is this strange obsession with what's known as the catabolic side of things, the side that involves tightening control and improving a specific type of function. It's basically the left brain of the left-right brain dichotomy. But there's also the anabolic, the side that has to do with rest, surrender, and holistic function. Catabolic is catch, anabolic is release. The virtue of the anabolic side is a bit hard to explain. Anabola is passive allocation of energies or calories. Uh, it is decided by your un slash subconscious and focuses on optimization of your being as a whole. When you meditate or do any particular activity that is supposed to make you stronger in some way, 
whether it's mind or body, we are performing a catabolic function. This may not be directly obvious because meditation seems so passive, but when you're actively trying to dismiss thoughts, or even actively observe your thoughts as something separate from your mind, as is sometimes done, you are engaging in a catabolic activity for your mind. Uh, I should note, though, that some things can be both catabolic and anabolic, depending on whether you are doing them to relax or doing them under pressure. The reason you meditate is to silence extraneous thoughts in your head, do you ever wonder why you have these thoughts? Understanding this is key to understanding passive anabolic principles. It's a part of your ability to process things, make plans, make judgments, etc. in your head. Sure, it would be nice if you could just find peace and exist simply without neurotic thoughts poking in and out, but you have these things because many things are being processed in your mind, and words are just one way you can convey meaning quickly during the process of you know, processing. Sleep is actually the same thing. It's your brain calibrating itself to reality and all the different aspects you have to keep up with and parts of your brain you have to maintain. You think in words, but words are just part of the puzzle relating to your more immediate consciousness and are not actually efficient. Obviously, animals don't think in words. Would an animal ever meditate? Doubtful. This is because their nervous system is optimized for survival not just peace of mind. Words are just a habit of thinking the human species uses. There's nothing wrong with them. If they disrupt your feelings of mental clarity and peace of mind, then that's really no different from the pain of physically healing, except it's your mind trying to quote-unquote heal or resolve whatever unresolved thoughts, doubts, worries, data, whatever you have in your nervous system. If you want to optimize your nervous system, just lay down and relax. You don't have to meditate. Don't do anything. In fact, this is the best way you can exercise. I know a lot of people have been critical of my uh, ideas about exercise, but there is actually an anabolic way you can exercise. Uh, see, normally when you exercise, you are trying to make yourself stronger, but in order to do that, you are also accomplishing the menial task of exercising, the various movements it entails. You're not just making yourself stronger, you're also performing work in a way. What I think is the best thing you can do, and while this is just a theory at this point because I don't have any personal desire to become physically strong, uh, though it is in fact based on some real science, I read on a site that I sadly cannot find anymore, that did specifically talk about flexing your muscles instead of doing lifts or whatever. And that the natural, the neural connection between your mind and the muscle was more important than the mass of the muscle itself when it comes to strength. So what you do is you just lay down and flex your entire body or whichever part of it you want to strengthen as hard as you can until you get tired. No weights or complicated routines required. This strengthens both your fundamental sense of will and your muscles and because it has no actual work being put into it, in the like physics sense of the word work, um, you are making the most caloric efficiency of your strength. In fact, there is uh, exactly one case study I can reference, and it's from a person I hold in high regard known as Less Visible. I'm, actually, I am, uh, I'm linking a point in a talk he did where he talks about time he spent in prison. And he basically did what I am suggesting and became incredibly physically strong. He, said, he says later in the video that, quote, if you take this dynamic tension thing just for like 10, 15 minutes a day, it will tone and tune up your body at a certain point, and it will make you very physically strong. It will also really bolster your immune system. And other people have tried this too, and it works, end quote. So that's one thing you can do but it's boring. And as we said before, boredom wastes lemons to suppress the pain it entails. You should really seek to entrain your mind with whatever it is usually drawn to, whether it be your reading or television or intellectual pursuits like politics or philosophy. People in olden times believed that music facilitates good digestion, and this is actually true. Whether you consciously know it or not, the entrained mind is rearranging the nervous system with not only the most ideal function of the body and mind by allocating energy without the pain of boredom, 
but also through a subconscious process of learning where everything you learn, knowing that you're not, is making you smarter in some way. And call me mad, this even applies to the dumbest of the dumb forms of entertainment. There's a part of your mind that is actually learning some kind of a skill from that, of learning how to process the world differently, and perhaps hone your thought process into new and more efficient formats. Your mind is drawn to these things for a reason. The best thing for you to do is exactly what you feel like doing, within the realm of what is sensible, of course. Does this really seem so absurd? What you want is not a mind free of words, but a fully optimized nervous system so that things just flow for you. To achieve this, avoid stressors, follow proper procedures to make sure you're not wasting lemons, and listen to what your body needs. I think a big part of why people think these ideas are crazy has to do with Christianity. Even if you're not a Christian, its ideology has deep roots in the psyche. But again, this is not exactly to label Christianity as a bad thing. Brett Weinstein makes a very useful point that is what I wanted to say here about things that are literally false but metaphorically true. That is to say, I believe there is actually some use to following the commandments of the Bible, even if the actual exact ideological context given is not in accordance with what is true in reality, like the concept of God. Check out this part of the Joe Rogan podcast he appears on to get a feeling for what I am talking about. I think in general Christianity has had, had, have had, has had many positive contributions to society. Though I'm not sure if it outweighs the negative, to be honest. But I don't want to dig into Christianity today. I just wanted to relate it to the question, why are we afraid of pleasure? Is it just because of a bad lemon-to-lemon ratio, like I said originally with drugs, in the 7 to 14 ratio? Or is it perhaps the subjective clause of fearing that every peak has its trough? It's probably because this instinct has served us in the past, but today there are reasons to disregard this notion. Like, let's talk about sex for a second. Obviously, sex carries risks, STDs, and most importantly, pregnancy. From a purely biological standpoint, a woman has more reason than a man to fear sex because pregnancy can be a serious problem. But contraceptive have changed things for women, and it may very well be that the greater hesitation women hold towards sex is because of that risk that previously existed. Uh, that would then mean that the hesitation is like a vestigial or organ in the body now because we can prevent pregnancy. On the male side of things, it might not actually make sense to be attracted to wide childbirthing hips anymore because we have made the risk of childbirth almost insignificant with modern practices like C-sections. But still, we carry these feelings. Sex is another way that our energy is spent quickly so it carries with it the lemon cost. But well, there's one thing I can say about that that most people are going to take contention with, and that is the orgasm. One way you can actually end up losing lemons is when you ejaculate, but Tantra is one good way of avoiding this. It's weird, but when you lose semen, you're sacrificing a certain amount of your immune system in order to create that. A lot goes into semen, actually. Supposedly, 37.5 megabytes of data is encased in each sperm cell, which means that an orgasm is about um, 15,875 gigabytes worth of data, all in one ejaculate. Your body has to make all that in the hopes of merging with an egg, but obviously that's not always happening. Instead, save the energy that goes into making all that with Tantra. That's just one basic health idea I hold. But anyway, let's go back to why culture holds an innate fear of pleasure, specifically from drugs. I think if you look at culture, there are three reasons. The first and most obvious one is that there is a rational fear of the consequences of drug use. Okay, easy enough. No problem with that, but the problem is they want you to think that that piece of the puzzle is all there is to it. Not true. Secondly, I think there is an active denial of the existence of drugs, because they know subconsciously they may be more predisposed to addiction than their egoic facades may let on. It's a pride thing, just like with green eggs and ham. 
They know that if they admit that they like it, they may end up wanting to do it. But this kind of thinking is delusional. The addictive personality exists whether you are in denial that it does or not. This may in fact be a defense mechanism ingrained in the psyche to avoid the dangers of addiction to dangerous drugs. But then, that doesn't account for the third reason. The third is that society is, like, allergic to the transcendental. And this doesn't have to relate to drugs. It relates to anything that changes our fundamental assumptions. Tradition and traditional thinking are the bedrock of society, and the people who enforce it uh, are like an immune system which attacks itself in confusion. To quote Timothy Leary, LSD is a drug which causes psychosis in people who haven't tried it. And I don't believe LSD is something anyone should go and do for fun. It's probably the most serious endeavor anyone can undertake in terms of their own conscious experience. I think people who abuse psychedelics are foolish. It is like a scientist who does experiments over and over without drawing useful conclusions or taking notes on what is happening in the experiment. You could use a psychedelic one time and spend years and years thinking about just that one experience, but, and I hate this part of society, we aren't even allowed to truly analyze our personal experiences with the transcendental. Even though some people do it just to get high, the people who do, the people who do have deep emotional experiences are delegitimized. The fact that psychedelics are illegal is a direct attack on our ability to make decisions for ourselves as mature adults. Let me read you a short quote from Terence McKenna and why he regards psychedelics as an important part of culture. If you are not a psychedelic person, and it doesn't appeal to you, that's fine too. That is not a requirement. What is a requirement is moral intelligence, and you have to get it one way or another in a hurry. The reason I speak for psychedelics is because that's the only thing I have ever seen work as fast as I think we have to have this change happen. If the Sermon on the Mount could have done it, we would have turned the corner then. We've had great teachers, and they were crucified, trampled, ignored, distorted, and perverted. The right idea is not enough. What is necessary is the lightning strike of true gnosis, however that can occur. I speak for psychedelics because I have felt their impact personally, and I have been with cultures that have stayed close to that campfire, and I have seen the beauty and the integrity and the humanness of those cultures, and we know this. I think it simply needs to be articulated and spread and made clear. End quote. Say whatever you want about psychedelics. They give you thoughts that are counter to societal norms, and it is because of that that they are illegal not because the government wants to protect you from them. There are no deaths associated with them. And this is coming from someone who wouldn't even do them if they were illegal. I just want to be able to talk freely about the psychedelic experience without feeling like a pariah. And this starts to go back to what I was talking about with the conversion in episode 1 of RCCG. There is an ignorance that is crucial to address in the mainstream ideology. And they know this full well, but they just don't want to hear it. It's a literal form of insanity that is enforced by the full brunt of the law. Thank God for the internet is all I can say. Understand me very clearly when I say that if you want to prevent people from having bad experiences on psychedelic drugs, you cannot make them illegal. This has never worked, and expecting it to work in the future is insanity. I made a video about this on the old channel, and I stand by it. All you can hope to do is educate people so that they can actually gain a sense of self-actualization from these things. And the potential for that is 100% undeniable. 100%. Can you say, with absolute certainty, that I am wrong if you yourself have never experienced a psychedelic? And this is the problem. People in the surface world have no interest in getting to know themselves on a deeper level, because that would undermine the very ridiculous notions that are commonplace in society. Like, there is this barrier when I start talking about my experience and the processes of being human in terms of energy, because people don't want to be reductionists like that. It's a bit of a philosophical quandary, because pleasure by its very nature is reductionist. And that is truly the goal here, widespread happiness and the means for achieving it. 
but in the situation of health, long-term sustained pleasure is just a signal that you are doing something right physically. And you can do a lot with that. Improve focus, recover from sickness faster, think more rationally, and just overall be a better person. But by God, achieving happiness through the inner worth rather than the outer worth is just madness in society. Everything starts to get too subjective for the status quo to handle. I have no car. I have no Facebook or cell phone. I don't want to make any big vacation plans. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these things, but they are used often to facilitate narcissism. A car isn't just a car, it's a status symbol. I think this is the largest barrier that exists to taking the next step forward in terms of understanding health, that we are too fixated on material things when all we really need is four walls and adobe slabs. We have a fixation on drugs as well, because in, re in reality, we do have an appreciation for the depth of ex internal experience that is available to us, but we don't know the methodology with which to achieve the maximal lemon output efficiency. So we end up with things like Buddhism, which are half-truths. Really, anyone who has pursued Buddhist ideals is treading the correct path. But like I said, a half-truth will remain a half-truth, and that's often what people who are seeking the full truth come to settle on when the full truth isn't immediately known or available. But this is problematic when we enter the realms of dogma, where a half-truth becomes um, fully consumed in its own ideology. Please watch this short video by Terence McKenna. It really explains the kind of attitude I've tried to embrace because I've been through it all, really, in terms of half-truths of this regard. Buddhism, yoga, alternative health, etc. And I came out the other side with my own ideas, just by following my own experiences and intuitions. Ideology makes us who we are, not just individually, but as a culture. And one way that our cultural ideology expresses and composes itself is its choice of drugs. Drugs are an inexorable part of culture. There is no force on earth that is going to stop people from doing them. So why not allow them to do drugs that have no danger of deadly overdoses? Drugs that encourage free thought and creative expression, instead of encouraging conformist tendencies, vanity, and materialism. Well, I can tell you why not. It's bad for the capitalistic system if people transcend the need for material possessions. Just like Bill Hicks said, What's going to happen to the war industry if we realize that we're all one? And this is a real tragedy. Tragedy. Instead of being sucked into the dramatic, shallow inebriation of alcohol, we could be exploring deep, emotional, thoughtful interactions with other people. And again, I'm not telling you to go out and do psychedelics. I'm saying that as a culture, we are actively choosing to oppress one way of thinking in the form of oppressing the drug that encourages that thinking. Please check out this H3 podcast with Michael Stevens of Vsauce for a sensible talk about psychedelics and the laws preventing us from using them. This goes back to what I said about uh, what I said in episode one again, where the underground introverted community of the internet is, repre is repressed by the surface reality. The powers that be don't want us to think too deeply. There is a kind of perpetual paranoia to the surface world. They're always a little bit afraid that, like, the rug is going to come out from under them. All their perfectly crafted little ducks in a row. The daily routine. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that army dude from American Beauty who doesn't want to realize that he is actually gay himself, despite being a homophobe. Stop pretending that these drugs do anything less than end your world. That's where this whole idea of enlightenment comes from in the first place. Coming off of it, as Alan Watts often says. Stop pretending you're not playing a complex game of hidden intentions, and that you're really just a little lord, slamming your fist down on the table because your drink is all gone. That's what really bugs me, all these facades. Terence McKenna talks a lot about psychedelics dissolving boundaries. Well, one of those boundaries that start to crumble is the personas people use to disguise their shadow selves. The animal consciousness starts to creep through the complicated human consciousness, breaking free of the social paradigms which regulate your behavior. 
you start to see things like the paradox between things that are implicit and the way that we act. And then you start thinking about the way that you're supposed to react to everything and how it fails to make sense. If you've been playing a game your whole life, it starts to slip away. And then what are you left with? A barren wasteland, and you realize that that barren wasteland is your soul. Then begins your search for meaning. But what I have found in terms of a search for ultimate meaning is there isn't one. It's all just lemons, and different people get their kicks out of different drugs, and by drugs I mean, as I stated earlier, just the different ways you control your environment to suit you, and your moods. Don't go out seeking enlightenment. Enlightenment is a silly concept, at least as being described by, uh, as some kind of ultimate epiphany that is the absolute goal of life and existence. Enlightenment is lemons, and every villain is lemons. Because really, a villain doesn't care about the stakes of the world at large. They are what they eat, and that is lemons. Or to put it differently, they are their own island. No concept of lands outside itself. Alan Watts says enlightenment is realizing you are completely selfish. Maybe evil in mindset is enlightenment, on the level of pure intellectualism at least because it is a kind of recognition of the truth of the endless void of wants we hold, an endless void into which lemons are fervently tossed for juice. But evil is always going to end in failure, because the never-ending horizon of ocean is an illusion. There are vast lands beyond the island of evil's consciousness. Maybe we need something more than that. Maybe we need limes. Limes could represent all the different priorities we hold as things that are outside our own basic biological needs. Life is complicated, and there's a lot of considerations to take into account if you want to be more than just an endless void, motivated by nothing but your id. Everyone really has to ask themselves in this lifetime, how can I hold all these limes? The sad truth is, sometimes you just can't hold every lime you want to hold. So in that sense, lemons are really only half the truth. We must embrace the primordial sprite that is reality. This is not to say that the pure id is something inherently bad like most people imagine. In fact, it's this fear of the pure id that motivates a lot of inherent evils in society that often guise themselves as noble and also causes us to regard drugs and pleasure as bad things all the time. People build egos around being stand-up citizens, and then perpetuate the suffering of people who live a life stratified far from their own, which may be full of problems a so-called nobleman can never relate to. A refusal to emphasize with people who end up going to jail is evil in its own right, because very often these people who are in jail were raised in environments which molded them in ways that were beyond their control. There is a relation here between people who seek pleasure in risque ways and end up going to jail, obviously. And so it goes that people acquire an aversion to the primal nature of the id. And this too is why people may think I am unhealthy because I am fat, actually. There is a perpetuated causation that links pleasure-seeking behaviors with eventual harm to the self. But this is born out of ignorance of correct methodologies, as I have talked about before. A person gets fat not because they are unhealthy, but because the factors that go into making them fat are always going to correlate with them becoming fat. But if you go beyond the methodology of society, as I have, you can actually be overweight and not be unhealthy, for that unhealthiness is caused by two inherent factors of A, pesticides and the like in food supplies, the more of what you consume, the more you damage your body, cellular structures, and brain. And B, each individual calorie consumed contributes to unhealthiness in the form of the putrefying bacteria that have begun to break the food down, even invisibly. When food is not preserved in accordance with the principles I've developed. <laughs> more on that can be found in this video I made recently, The Myth of Unhealthy Food. And I think this point about drugs and being overweight is so important, because I know that people are going to be inclined to disagree with me. 
but this is no more than adherence to old principles which have served us in the past. I know these principles well, and you don't need to spew them at me to prove any point, because I've moved far beyond any of you have even taken those principles for yourself. I've come out the other side and found my own sense of health enlightenment. I did intermittent fasting, I did sprinting exercises when I read that long distance running was bad for you and deteriorates muscles while it burns fat simultaneously. And if you look at professional marathon runners, this is plainly clear. Eat only organic food and eat only farmer's market, pure organic food and nothing else at all. When I read that even organic foods had quote-unquote natural pesticides on them, used a Berkey water filter to filter out fluoride, sought out non-GMO foods, and avoided all grains, took all manner of supplements, which can be seen actually even in the backgrounds of old videos I've made, and I had a constant yoga and meditation practice, every conceivable thing when it comes to health. So when you come to me and say, X argument isn't complete, and have you heard of this health science in practice because it says you're wrong, I just laugh because I know this is just me on hunting season versus all the half-truths of the world. I will continue to drink soda every day of my life because I know that the pleasure it brings me is in direct correlation with the health it brings. If only I could make you understand the network of neuroticism that goes into all of this, but that will be topics to address for another time. For the doubter out there, I will pose this question as my line in the sand that you cannot cross before critiquing my ideas. If sugarcane is good for you, for what cause is there to fear refined sugar? Of course, I've already explained that. In the meantime, I will be a servant to these ideas, standing with them like Galileo when he did posit that the earth was not central to the sun. And in the wake of the thunderbolts and lightning that are your insults, I will postpone any recanting with every breath. Will you ever let me go? For I am forever under house arrest, accused of the high crime of treasonous thoughts against the glorious state of the hive mind. See you, information cowboy.